You're watching Euronews Now. I'm Takumbo Salako with your top stories. A multi-billion cash boost for Ukraine and an oil price cap to squeeze Russia's revenues. G7 leaders have had a busy morning in Bavaria. We'll have all the details of what's come out of their summit. The UN's Security Council will hold a special session later to discuss Russia's deadly attack on a Ukrainian shopping center. Also in the program, a cleanup operation is underway in a southern Dutch town hit by a rare tornado described by some weather watchers as deadly but weak. Well, let's get more now on that G7 summit which has been taking place in Bavaria. We can speak to our correspondent Shona Murray, who's been following the story for us. Uh, Shona, what more do we know at this point? Well, what we expect is for the G7 leaders now to say that they will explore the potential idea of a price oil cap on Russian oil. It means that developing countries can still access Russian oil, but at a maximum price so that you would reduce the amount of money that Russia gets for its war chest. Now, this is amongst the, obviously, the seven most industrialized countries in the world. What it does need is formal agreement from the likes of India and China, countries that do buy up Russian oil. India was present at the meeting yesterday so um, there is some contemplation from Narendra Modi that India will support this it is very complicated but the idea is that it would complement uh, the EU's and other countries uh, sanctions packages where they've had an embargo on Russian oil we'll also uh, have a 29 billion euro announcement for support for Ukraine military support humanitarian support and obviously it comes in light of that horrendous attack in the center of Ukraine Ukraine, Ukraine yesterday Tokes. We also heard from G7 leaders, we've been speaking about it, describing that attack as a war crime. Have they had anything further to say about that and, and perhaps more specifically what they plan to do? Well, I think a lot of that military aspect will move on to Madrid tomorrow where NATO leaders will be meeting. Um, and actually we have discussed uh, you know, the re response to that attack at the shopping centre. And um, definitely is a consensus that this is a horrific war crime intended to take place while the G7 is meeting. But at the same time, there's also a feeling that this is just the daily life of Ukrainians under heavy bombardment by Russia for almost five months now. And every attack is as bad and as unjustified as the other. Uh, so there is a feeling um, and very much so strong support that the G7 and the global community should be steadfast in its continuous support for Ukraine militarily, from a humanitarian perspective, and also um, from an economic perspective in the next weeks, months and years. Tokes? Shona Murray reporting for us there from Bavaria, where that G7 summit is taking place. Thank you. G7 leaders have pledged support for Ukraine in the war against Russia, keeping sanctions going and sending weapons for as long as it takes. The message of intent delivered to Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky via a video link at the summit in Germany was hardly dry on the lips when Moscow's missiles struck a direct hit on a shopping mall in central Ukraine. The deadly strike has caused an international outcry. France's new foreign minister, Catherine Colonna, condemned the targeting of civilians, saying Russia must be held accountable for its actions. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken also said Russia and those responsible for atrocities must be held to account. U.K. Prime Minister Boris Johnson condemned what he called Vladimir Putin's cruelty and barbarism. And G7 host German Chancellor Olaf Scholz had earlier accused Russia of breaking all the rules. We all Das haben wir versichert, werden die Ukraine in ihrer Verteidigung gegen Russland. We've all given assurances that we'll continue to support Ukraine in its defense against Russia. What is clear is that this war is a deep, deep breach in international relations. Earlier, I very consciously called this a turning point because of Russia's attack on Ukraine. All the rules, all the agreements that we've made with each other about the way the cooperation of states have been broken, especially the understanding that borders should not be moved by force. Soldiers worked long into the night trying to clear the steel girders from the destroyed shopping center in the city of Kremachuk. 
The casualty figures following Russia's missile strike remain difficult to determine. At least 16 people have died and dozens more are wounded. Around 1,000 people are estimated to have been inside. Russia says it does not target civilians. The UK government's bid to scrap parts of post-Brexit trade arrangements in Northern Ireland cleared its first hurdle, despite EU warnings it is illegal and could spark a trade war. MPs in the House of Commons voted through the controversial Northern Ireland Protocol Bill by 295 votes to 221, allowing it to progress to the next stage of scrutiny in Parliament. But the prior debate in the House has managed to divide members of the ruling Conservative Party that this bill is both necessary and legal, and the government has published a legal statement setting it out. I actually started off by asking myself three questions. First of all, do I consider this to be legal under international law? Second, will it achieve its aims? And third, does it at least maintain the standing of the United Kingdom in the eyes of the world? And my answer to all three of those questions is no. The protocol requires checks on goods arriving into Northern Ireland from the rest of the UK to track products headed to the EU via the Republic of Ireland. This creates a customs border down the Irish Sea, keeping Northern Ireland in the EU's customs orbit, something which unionist parties oppose. Well, last night, the UK's unilateral attempt to override the Northern Ireland Agreement struck as part of the Brexit deal with the European Union passed its first parliamentary hurdle. At its second reading in the House of Commons, the Conservative Party, which has a working majority, comfortably won, despite having opposition from some of their own MPs, and in particular, Theresa May, the former Prime Minister who herself led Brexit negotiations for a number of years. She said that the move would break international law and it would damage the UK's reputation around the world. The Conservative Party, though, were backed by the Northern Ireland Democratic Unionist Party, who are at the moment are refusing to form a government in the Northern Ireland Assembly because they want changes to this protocol. But it doesn't mean it's plain sailing. What will happen now is that the bill moves to the House of Lords, the upper house in the British parliamentary system, and there it could face real opposition and could be voted down. It would then go into a process known as ping pong, where it goes back to the House of Commons, it could be voted on again, but then loses again in the Lords, and then the government has to use a special constitutional measure to override the House of Lords and get it passed. But that would mean that it would be delayed by up to around a year which could mean it could clash with election timing for Boris Johnson. So it doesn't mean yet that this is fully secured. It does mean, however, that the UK is risking its reputation. The EU is saying that this is the wrong thing to do, that this is what was agreed, and it's what keeps the Good Friday peace agreement in place. The British government says, though, that there was always a mechanism in case things didn't work. They said that the fact that the border checks at the customs points are causing real problems with supplies in Northern Ireland. Uh, the fact that the unionist community isn't on board, still having the oversight of the ECJ, not being able to control VAT rules is a big problem for them. Vincent McAvinney, Euronews, County Monaghan, Ireland. A tornado ripped through a southwestern Dutch city on Monday, killing one person and injuring ten others. It was the first fatal twister to hit the country for three decades. The whirlwind left a trail of destruction through the seaside city of Zierikzee, ripping the roofs off homes and toppling trees onto cars. That sound with the image of the roof coming off and everything flying around is so frightening because you don't know what it's going to do. You see the roof coming off and you see it coming toward you and you think all hell is going to break loose here. Local media said the person killed was a tourist who was hit on the head by a roof tile in the city's harbour area. The Netherlands flat landscape sitting just above sea level makes it vulnerable to extreme weather, although the Dutch Meteorological Agency said it only experiences a few tornadoes per year. This is Euronews Now. Much more news and analysis coming up after this brief break.